You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. Blessedly. January 17th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. It's Casual Friday, folks. I am wearing a soft-collared shirt. Joining us on the program today, Heather Parton, or Digby, from the blog Hullabaloo, the redesigned Hullabaloo. Also on the program today, I believe, just to express the inner anger and frustration that at the very least I feel, Judy Gold will be with us. Meanwhile, Lev Parnas says that Donald Trump's lawyer, John Dowd, told him to take one for the team. Impeachment and vulnerable Republican senators can't keep up with the geyser. Gusher? Geyser gusher of new evidence. Meanwhile, Florida Supreme Court imposes a poll tax on former Convicts. Bernie Sanders catches Biden and passes him by a hair among registered voters nationally. The Pentagon reveals that actually 11 to- troops were injured in last week's Iranian missile attacks. Expert testimony given in a federal court contends that the Georgia election server was breached before the 2016 and 2018 elections. Meanwhile, the Russian government resigns en masse to let Putin put rewrite the Constitution in convenient ways. Matt Gates accused of designing a point system game of sleeping with state house staffers and a massive review of single payer cost estimates show that Medicare for all saves and as Virginia preps for a militia assault on Monday Democratic Socialist Delegate Lee Carter has to head to a safe house over a right wing conspiracy theory and massive death threats all this and more on today's program Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the show. You know, um, having been a longtime student of right-wing talk radio, of talk radio, broadly speaking, but of, um, oh, they're doing, they're vacuuming early today. That's fantastic. Uh, Of right-wing talk radio, I know that uh, if you listen to uh, Rush Limbaugh, strategically, and what they tell you, you know, when you talk to radio consultants, they always always say, you've got to make it sound like uh, there's a couple of things you got to do. Um, you got to um, – one of the things they always tell you is like we've got to hurry through this to, to get to this other stuff because it, it creates a sense of anticipation, um, which I think I do naturally because we always do got to hurry through stuff because we don't have enough time now these days with the news. You know, we do two and a half hours. When when old Matt – and I want to say uh, thank you again to uh, Matt Bender for uh, filling in yesterday. When old Matt – uh, and I was talking to him. I was like, hey, hey do you want to uh, fill in and do the fun half? He's like, yeah. How much time are you doing on the show uh, these days? And I'm like, well, I think it's the same. How much time did we do when you were here? And he's like, we would we would end at 1.30. And I was like, what? Really? 
geez, no wonder why I'm so exhausted. We we go to two thirty now every day. And um, go beyond so, that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we try and keep it within two thirty. Like, but we never end before two thirty. I mean, it, maybe it happens once in a blue moon. There's a range. Originally, the idea was. We're going to, I, I think it, it turned out I was going to offer 45 minutes of a free show and then another 45 minutes of a fun half. And that's reasonable. And in some day, we will go back to that. <laughs> Anyways, my point is, is that they tell you to rush through the thing. And the other thing that Rush Limbaugh does is he says, that was the fastest week in media. Because the idea is that he's trying to make the news digestible to you. And um, that has some relevance in another story that we're going to talk about later, actually, that came from a, that that dovetails with a, an essay that uh, Chris Hayes wrote uh, 15 years ago. But, but all that aside, the point is, is that this has been an exhausting week. It felt like um, I was ready for Friday sometime around, I think, Tuesday at 10 a.m. TMBS tomorrow at 5.30, so... Tomorrow, Saturday at 5.30? Indeed. Good Lord. Oh, really? Oh, so Michael must be back, in other words. Oh, back-ish. well. Backish. Backish, yes. Well, whatever. Um, he should really actually tell me about that, because we could have had something else scheduled. But uh, maybe we will. Um, anyways, uh, so uh, this has been a very long week, obviously a tremendous amount of news. And buckle up, folks. It only gets worse from here. Um or better, depending on how much uh, you love to hear the vo- the sound of our, our voices here. Uh, next week, the impeachment uh, trial will begin on, on not on Tuesday. On Tuesday? I thought it was going to be on Thursday. But I guess it's going to be on Tuesday. Um, and then the following week, in addition to having the impeachment trial, we will have the Iowa caucuses on Monday. We will be doing... Um, Coverage. We haven't quite figured this out yet exactly how this is going to happen. I have a feeling I'm just going to bring a cot in here and uh, just to somehow like go Let's home hang to a hammock from the rafter and, and <laughs> so, somehow maybe go home and, and, you know, help the kids to school and then uh, come back down here. On Monday, we have the Iowa caucuses. On Tuesday, we have the State of the Union. On Friday, uh, we have a debate. Uh, that is taking place, uh, the Democratic debate. That's on February seventh. Now that's yeah, we're now two weeks out now. So, um, well, all all that will be happening. We have the impeachment and this and that, and so that's um, it, it, it's sheer insanity around here. And I want to thank uh, all of you for um, for being with us and supporting the program. We have announced we're now live on Twitter, um, and uh, I think we'll probably do that for a while like this. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, our revenue is primarily made in terms of video. We're on Twitch. We're on Twitter. We're on everything that starts with a TW that we're aware of. We're also on YouTube. YouTube is the only place that we get any uh, revenue from the video, but uh, we're trying to expand the reach of the show just for the sake of expanding the reach of the show. And um, on YouTube, we've been getting a little bit demonetized as of late. It's unclear why. Sometimes these happens. Uh, but that's why I want to just say I appreciate all of you who have uh, joined the show, become members, supported it. Um, you know, we give you, uh, you we, we deliver you uh, the audio uh, on, uh, you know, cut of uh, commercials uh, and you get the extra content every day and it's all on demand. But at the end of the day, your support uh, by becoming members is how we do the show. And um you know, we don't we don't spend a, a huge amount in trying to con- configure all sorts of bonuses. We try and do it as it comes up. But at the end of the day, when you become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com, what you're, you're basically doing is you're supporting our ability to do all of this. And we are um, doubling down on the AM Quickie. You will notice over the coming weeks uh, that um, we're we're upgrading uh, all sorts of different elements of it. We're we're getting it out earlier in the morning. We're tweaking it uh, editorially a little bit. They're, you know, make it a little more fun, just a little bit, not too much. 
Uh, but it's a great way to keep up with the stories that, that, you know, with all this information that's coming out. It's a great way to just keep up so that you don't feel like you, you don't know what's happening out there. Um, we'll talk about that Hayes piece a little bit. But the, the, one of the elements of it that's interesting is the idea of like there are people who like politics, who, who are interested in it in the same way that people are interested in uh, other hobbies, per se. And then there are other people who don't like politics, but still realize that they should vote and they should choose somebody for president. And um, that's going to come up and be salient later. So uh, Rachel Maddow had this two part interview with Lev Parnas. And the first was Wednesday night. The second one was Thursday night. I did not see all of this live yet. I've only watched clips at this point of Thursday night because uh, my daughter had a, uh, a, a music recital. She did great. But um, after the first night, one of the things that struck me was, what, why is he doing this? It was unclear. And then was also curious as to if John Dowd still um, represented him. I think maybe we talked about this on air yesterday. I can't quite remember. But there were stories that John Dowd, who was the president's attorney, was going to get into a joint defense agreement with Parnas via Rudy Giuliani, uh, with also uh, uh, Igor Fruman, who was Parnas's, I don't know, like, uh, you know, Pancho Sancho, uh, Sancho Panza. And, um, and, what it did is by by binding them all together, they started to have client, uh, attorney client privilege amongst that would cross over a couple of different places. And this was relevant because Paul Manafort had the same deal with Donald Trump via John Dowd, made a deal with prosecutors, and then later prosecutors realized that what he was doing was just getting information. He was taking one for the team, and he was just getting information as to what the prosecutors knew and relating it back to the president's defense team. And so I was a little suspicious about Parnas because it said he was represented by this guy, Bondi, but it, there was no stories about resolving his relationship with John Dowd. And uh, that was the big thing that came out of uh, last night's one of the big things that came out of last night. Uh, Apparently, Parnas fired John Dowd. Now, I guess it's conceivable that that's not true and they're still working together. I don't know, but that would be highly unlikely. When John Dowd and the president got into a defense um, agreement with Parnas, they accepted the premise that Parnas and Giuliani or Giuliani and via Parnas, that they had a unique relationship with each other that could, that had to be protected. In other words, Parnas was working more or less for the president or at the president's direction. That's going to have big implications if if any of the old rules of the way that this stuff works is operable anymore, which it it, it may not be. But here is uh, Lev Parnas. And the only thing I could think about when he was talking about this is that scene where uh, when um, Robert Duvall as uh, the consigliari to, um, uh, you know, the godfather, I can't remember his name uh, in the movie, goes and meets with what's-his-face, the bald guy, in the uh, prison and tells them, you know, like, you know, like uh, what the what the Romans used to do. Take one for the team. And that's what apparently Parnas got that cu- that talk doesn't seem as dramatic, but. Mr. Dowd was your attorney for a time and then you changed attorneys. I fired him in jail. You fired him when you were in jail. Yes. What, what happened there? And Mr. Downing. Uh, basically. Uh, when we were arrested, obviously I had nowhere else to call. I didn't know. Uh, we just retained Dowd and Downing. So I called uh, Downing to come there. Uh, and Pause it for one seeing- second. Now, you know, look, it's very possible that what Parnas is doing here is trying to get some type of immunity because there's stuff that he did that was even worse than what he's copping to. 
Okay. And uh, so you've got to be very, very careful. I don't think he's telling any lies per se. I think he's omitting some things, although there's some there, there, some of these things could also be lies. So you have to be very careful. Right. But like just even that moment where he says, like, I called and then we he, he stopped at what he was saying. And he said, I well, He didn't know he when he got arrested, he called somebody and maybe it was Giuliani and maybe it wasn't. But somehow he got in touch with the president's attorneys. Now, I don't know why he doesn't want to reveal that or whatnot. But remember, the whole thing about Parnas here is that he thinks that he's being set up by the Justice Department to be the fall guy for the president of the United States. And, you know, we've heard all these things about the Southern District of New York is so independent. They practically call it a separate agency from the the Justice Department. You know, this puts there's a little bit of a question here. You know, we don't know who who to believe, but there is some there there there's some truth to this stuff. All right. So just go back. Uh, When we were arrested, obviously, I had nowhere else to call. I didn't know. Uh, We just retained Dowd and Downing. So I called uh, Downing to come there. Uh, And I started seeing in the process of the bail stuff, the way things were going on, that they were more concentrate concentrating on. I didn't feel that they were trying to get me out. And uh, at that point, uh, I had a meeting with John Dowd and and Downing inside the jail. uh, And John Dowd just instead of comforting me and, you know, trying to calm me down, telling me, like, it's going to be okay, like, don't worry, basically start talking to me like a drill sergeant and telling me, giving me orders, like, you know, like, be a good boy, like, you know. He said be a good boy? No, like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to quote him exactly on what the words, what he used in that, because it was a, a while ago and I don't remember exactly, but it was, it was his condescending attitude towards basically, like, who do you think you are, you know, telling the president or Giuliani or anybody to, like, uh, come out and, because because I, one of the things I said, I said, I can't believe nobody's coming out in our defense and saying, like, we didn't do, like, wrong, we're good citizens, that, you know, we work. And uh, basically, word for word, and then I said, uh, if you don't get out of here right now, uh, something bad's going to happen because I don't want to see the two of you. And at that point, Downing hit the emergency button, mm. and the security took me out and took them out. So this is a very heated confrontation. Very you heated. told Downing and Dowd to get out. I threw them out. Were they telling you to sacrifice yourself in order to protect the president? That's what I felt. Is the implication of this story of the lawyers um, that you feel that people loyal to the president and close to the president were trying to influence your defense and your case in a way that was against your interests, but in the president's interests? Absolutely. Yeah. And... I guess the idea is that the reason why he's coming to the media is because he's not sure, you know, if there are prosecutors that he can trust. And he, I, I, I certainly have no idea. <laughs> um, and it's, it's hard. Let's put it this way. If you're the president of the United States or you're Giuliani or you're Dowd or you're any of these people, it is hard to imagine what what value you would get out of having Parn, Parnas come out now. Like, you know, like, I'm, you know, it, it's hard to figure out what the angle would be. It's not like there is a huge hunger in Congress to find something more. Right. Not broadly speaking, at least. And if he is covering up for something much, much, much bigger, I, which I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think it is like th- that's the only possible way. Like there's no there's just no far flung theory that you could come up with to suggest that this guy is doing this for some like, you know, QAnon reason. I think he the guy actually is just doing this because he thinks it gives him the maximum leverage. And uh, against what he doesn't think that, you know, he thinks he's going to be the fall guy for this and he's trying not to be. What you can believe of his tale, I don't know. But what it's doing is it's creating pressure on members of the House to go forward with something, bring him in, testify, 
get a deposition, whatever it is. And as that becomes more intriguing and involve more intrigue, it puts more pressure on those Republican members of the Senate that um, I have been arguing for, you know, ad nauseum is what impeachment is about really in terms of the material benefit that we're going to get from it. And may may hurt Donald Trump down the road, may not. I don't, you know, I doubt it. Maybe it does. He certainly, it, it upsets him. It certainly keeps them busy. It keeps that a Senate. This is going to be the longest break, I would imagine, that the Senate has taken from uh, shoving right-wing justices into the, into the uh, courts. And so if it's like five less justices that are, uh, you know, judges, I should say, that are in the federal courts, that, you know, that's enough. Dianu, as uh, we say at Passover. But what it, what it's also going to do is is hurt these uh, senators. And when I say these senators, go Google the least popular sen- senators in the country. And, um, you know, four out of six of those are on that list. Five. Joni Ernst, Susan Collins, Martha McSally. She's finally done it. You should give yourself uh, the bugle. Yeah. The horns. I know. We're the, the thing's broken. we got to get a new iPad. Um, Martha McSally, uh, Tom Tillis, he's crept up a little bit. Um, and Cory Gardner, they're all apoplectic right now. And it only gets worse for them. And I got, I got news for you. They're hoping that voters are going to forget these votes. Whoever's running against them, those those it, that the voters are not going to get forget these votes because people are going to pour a lot of money into ads that are going to remind them about these votes. That's the bottom line. So, like I say, folks, a tremendous amount of news out there. One of today's sponsors is News Voice. It's the first entirely open, crowdsourced and democratized platform for news. You can download the app for free at newsvoice.com slash majority. Look. We have a situation where we have intense media consolidation. Hard to keep up if you don't do this professionally to know the biases that exist in in certain types of media. Corporate bias, right wing bias, even, you know, left wing bias or perspective, completely biased towards facts. But that's just my own editorial there. Um, But News Voice helps you keep track of this. It's a free crowdsourced website and mobile app. It lets you create your personalized news feed, maintain a clear picture of where your news is coming from, what political slants may exist. This, if you want to learn to be a, 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 a critical reader of the media, this is the way you do it. Over time, you start to see certain assumptions that are baked into stories. And you do that by comparing them from different perspectives. News Voice is fueled by its community of users. They contribute to the platform by fact-checking, submitting stories and sources that are missing, upvoting stories and writing story summaries. You can also comment on stories and debate politics with other members of the community. And through staying active in the community, you can level up. You earn perks on the platform. The News Voice Play feature lets you listen to your personal news feed every day. They have customizable audio news playlists, and it's your own personally tailored radio station for news. News Voice is a next-generation news aggregator and social media platform that values transparency, good journalism, and productive political discussions. Get totally free access by going to newsvoice.com slash majority. Put a link underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, Check it out, folks. Also, uh, I am super excited uh, about the weekend because it means that I get to sort of unplug for a little bit. The way I'm doing it uh, these days is through Skillshare, which is sponsoring the program today. Anybody who goes to skl.sh slash Majority Report 5 is going to get two entire months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library, and they have thousands of online classes. It's an online uh, learning community for everybody from creatives to freelance business owners to entrepreneurs to people who just want to get better at their hobby or learn a new skill or learn a new hobby or whatever. Skillshare's classes range from illustration, painting, graphic design, photography, video editing, web design, bookkeeping, marketing, productivity, everything in between. 
Skillshare's video lessons let you learn at your own pace and you can fit in any schedule. They have classes for all skill levels. Whether you're already a master of what you do or whether you're just beginning, it doesn't matter. I told you guys, like, I, I took Lucid Dreaming uh, 101. I, I'm going to go uh, review that. Now, the, th- the beauty of it is, like, it, it has lessons, like, I don't know. I can't remember how many uh, Lucid Dreaming. It was, like, eight or nine. But they're chapters. So you can listen to a little bit and break it up. But uh, I'm, I've got the weekend to myself this weekend. I'm going to le- review the whole thing, one through ten, or whatever it was, one through eight. Get my Lucid Dreaming going. And then the other thing, as I was looking around, I'm going to create a digital calendar. I don't even know what that means, but like I need to get organized. People don't understand. I've got so much information flowing at me constantly. Logistics, that's all my life is, is logistics. So if I can find like, uh, it's either going to be that or the Evernote thing. Learn how to use Evernote because I think that also could help us in the office, but whatever. All right. Uh, the point is each class is under 60 minutes to split up into convenient individual lessons, like I say, and you don't have to pay per class. Once you get a membership to Skillshare, you can you can you can go through every single class on their platform. I mean, it would take you probably a year, but uh, if you did it constantly, there's thousands, and you'll never run out of ways to fuel your uh, fuel your curiosity or to satiate your your desire for knowledge. You can make 2020, where is a year where you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, get lost in creativity. I learned how to take uh, good shots on my iPhone class there i didn't want to go you can go deep into the photography classes too but I, i'm just you know, i want to know how to do it on my iphone that's it the best part is a membership is less than 10 bucks a month but the majority of port audience can enjoy two entire months of free membership to skillshare and you get full access to all their classes they know you're gonna love it so when you uh you check it out you still gonna have two months to you can see it you can you can watch as many classes as you want to skl.sh slash majority report five the number five we put a link in the podcast notes or under the video if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, check it out. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Digby about all of it. See you there. The future's been sold Every night we're gone And the karaoke song How we like to sing along Though the words are We are back. Sam Cedar, the Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, on some casual Fridays, I just want to kick back and listen to some good tunes like this one. Are you ready for some pee Parton Digby, um, I have decided that um, when my son, who is now six, when he gets bar mitzvahed, we're getting a band, and I'm going to have them cover that. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, I really do. <laughs> if it if it wasn't about me, I'd still love it. I, I honestly, I, I I can't help but picture like a lot of uh, people my age and older dancing at a uh, yeah, like a course. wedding or a bar mitzvah to that song. <laughs> Um, That's right. Uh, so, uh, 
Heather, um, let's see. What could we talk about this week? Um, I don't know. Let's let's just start with uh, what you know. There was a debate this week. There was basically the um, the breach of the of the non aggression pact uh, between the um, left candidates in the um, uh, Democratic primary. Um, uh, I, you know. I, I, we got to touch on it a little bit. I, I don't want to go too deep into it because, you know, you made a great point when we were talking on uh, Ring of Fire radio this week that, like, there's 10 other stories and, and you can list them. But um, your your take on this, I mean, I, I, you know, and I think I've I've made it clear to people that I think there, there's a multiple of, uh, of scenarios. I don't care too deeply about any of them. My assessment was that this was... Um, there was there was an attempt by uh, the team Warren, I think, to prove that she was strong enough to overcome what I think they may assume is a concern among, and I think this was geared towards Biden and Buttigieg supporters who have her rated second and may be choosing Biden and Buttigieg first because they're afraid that a woman can't win in this environment or that she's not enough of a fighter. And I think she was trying to prove to those people that that's what— um, I think that's what that this was about. I, I I thought it was ill-conceived if that was the case. If it was just sloppiness, then it was sloppiness, which is problematic. But, I, you know, to the extent that we have any feedback in terms of polls, it doesn't seem to have helped much. But what's your take on this? Well, I mean, I, you know, I have no idea what exactly happened. I don't think anybody does. But I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, you know, these, you know, primaries at this stage almost always get, you know, just a little bit ugly. It's just, it's the nature of the beast. They're tired. They're working 24-7. Staff gets out in front. The, the candidates themselves get testy. I mean, we've seen this before. We saw it in 2004 when John Kerry, you know, put out an ad that <laughs> that morphed Howard Dean into Osama bin Laden. I mean, we all remember 2008. I mean, that just went on and on and on. So, you know, this is not unusual. I don't think it was particularly uh you know, rude uh, compared to some of the other stuff that we've seen in primaries. So I'm not particularly concerned. I think, I think, you know, this will blow over, but I have to say that, you know, and I'm just, I'm going to criticize the media a little bit. I get why the, you know, why partisans, you know, why Warren people and Bernie people would be up in arms. You know, if you're heavily invested in a candidate and this kind of thing happens, you get really upset, you know, when, when things go this way. And, And I get that. It's always like that. But the media decided that they were going to put that at the top. I mean, they, you know, last week it was, it was, you know, Meghan and Harry. And this week it was this handshake as being equivalent to the cavalcade of stories that are absolutely overwhelmingly more important. For instance, Australia has burned up. It's burned up, and it's burned up because of climate change, and it's burned up because of horrible political leadership that basically put the, uh, you know, the, the needs of the coal industry in Australia above everything else. And they have this guy who runs – he was you know, fairly recently elected, the prime minister there who you – know, he believes in the rapture for one thing. Uh, you know, he's a super you know, extremist religious you know, zealot. Uh, who was also in the pocket of the coal industry. And, you know, I don't remember, you know, the American media really just kind of, eh, you know, whatever. It is not. That was a dead canary in the Australian coal mine for the rest of the world, and we basically sort of ignored it. I mean, you know, we had the Russian government just resigned this week, uh, all of them, because Vladimir Putin is consolidating his power and may, you know, name himself president for life. That's important. I, it's something that really we should be looking at. And, and you know, we had, uh, um, you know, we were almost on the brink of war last week. I mean, clearly, we weren't just almost. We were on the brink of war last week with Iran. That story has not gone away. The, the, everything that happened in the lead-up to it, and in fact, yesterday they just revealed that there were 11 injuries in that at, at one of the bases. These guys all got, you know, concussions, and they don't know if they're going to be okay. That's a big problem. And, and the lies that led up to that are, are, have nev- haven't been fully unraveled. So I guess what I'm just saying is, you know, I get it. I understand why people care about this. I care about it, too. It's not that I don't care, but 
honestly. It's it's not, you know, we are living in this whirlwind of, of important, vitally important news around the world and in this country. And by the way, I didn't even mention what's going on in the border. Uh, they're now transporting people from the border down to the center of Mexico and leaving them there. That's the new, the, the latest uh, ploy that they're using down there to keep people from trying to come over the border. That is exactly what they did during the Operation Wetback um, operation back in the 1950s. People die when you do that. You take them away and drop them someplace that they don't have any idea. I mean, it's just, it's cruel. And Donald Trump, by the way, talked about that in the, on the campaign trail. So I'm sure he and Stephen Miller got a big kick out of out of this new latest one, which they're doing in concert with the with the Mexican government. I mean, this whole thing is just is just awful. And and so you know, I, I realize that we're in the middle of a primary campaign, and it's very important. And you know, we have to do, you know we're going to fight through that over the next few months. But to me, it's just you know, it's down the list of about <laughs> at about twenty of things that I'm actually. Uh, caring about at the moment. I think Warren and Sanders will work it out. I really do. Did, did you even mention the impeachment and not just the impeachment, but then this, this whole <laughs> new sort of like massive dump which uh, of information, which could range from uh, implicating Pence and Barr um, in not only in the Ukrainian um, uh, sort of uh, escapades, but, you know, to have a uh, to believe Lev Parnas, um, Bill Barr is running a basically a criminal enterprise out of the Department of Justice uh, and the potential, you know, if we want to be skeptical about what Parnas is doing, the potential that maybe they were contemplating some type of hit on or physical like attack of or making it seem like she was under some type of imminent physical harm of a U.S. ambassador. I mean, this, uh, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> well, or, listen, or you know, if you want to just do a sidelight, if you want to just do a sidelight, you could talk about like, hey, folks, guess who's defending the president? It's the <laughs> exactly. same t- the same team who who defended um, uh, Epstein, in his case down in Florida. The, you know, Dershowitz and Ken Starr getting the band back together to represent the latest freak. I mean, <laughs> but all right, well, that's uh, let's let's I mean, we'll, we'll get to all these stories. Maybe I don't know uh, over the course of the next 10, 15 years. Uh, but uh, let's let's talk about uh, impeachment and then and, and then, you know, I guess talk about what's happening with Parnas. I mean, um, the impeachment stuff is, uh, you know, in retrospect, The timing, it starts to become clear what Nancy Pelosi was doing in terms of the timing anyways. Yeah. Yeah, you and I, and I think you and I actually actually predicted this several months ago when we were talking about this, you know, what what is the... What's the theory behind this? And it had to do with, with squeezing these vulnerable Republican senators, as you said earlier. Um, and, you know, they're coming up against, you know, potential uh, primary, um, primary challenges or having to defend a vote that, you know, and by the way, I mean, what this shows, her timing in this, leaving this interregnum between the uh, impeachment hearing and the vote uh, for articles of impeachment, and now actually delivering the articles, is that all these things have have happened in the interim. You know, there were FOIA requests that, that finally made it that showed that they were, that basically the White House knew they were breaking the law. And by the way, the GAO just, um, you know, they released a report yesterday saying that they had, in fact, broken the law when they withheld the money from Ukraine. But all these other things, I mean, you know, there's a, and I've been saying from the beginning, you know, with this Parnas Giuliani thing was always going to be, it, that story was just barely bubbling up to the surface when they, when they voted for impeachment. And since then, these Ukrainian shoes have been dropping one by one by one, and it's really starting to pile up, including, you know, of course, this big bombshell with Parnas. So what, what these Republican senators are faced with is if I vote, you know, against the president, am I going to get a primary challenger? Or if I vote for him, 
which they probably will. Um, but, you know, if I vote for him, what is going to be happening between now and then that's going to call into question my judgment on that, right. especially if they refuse to call witnesses and everybody, they're going to be accused of being part of the cover up. And so this has always been the squeeze. And it's an important one, too. I mean, Mitch McConnell, it's just as important to get rid of him as it is to get rid of Donald Trump, maybe more. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that because Trump is obviously insane. But, you know, McConnell is right up there and is his top henchman. And, you know, he's what they, they call the grave digger of democracy. And so it's vitally important that Democrats take back the Senate as well. And it's doable. This is this is one of those those uh, cycles where they've got a lot of people up and they are in those purple states and some and you know they're they're between a rock and a hard place as you pointed out many of them are the most unpopular <laughs> unpopular senators in the country so this is important to do that so i give i give pelosi and i have to assume that schumer was you know involved in the strategy as well that i give them some credit for doing it the way that they did, you know, you and I had our differences and all along the way, but in this one respect, I, I have to give them some credit. So, you know, here we are now, um, you know, on the eve of the trial with all this new information spilling out. And, you know, as you point out, I mean, I don't know what to believe about Parnas. He's obviously a shady character. He's been involved in all kinds of stuff that is questionable. And so, you know, you have to take you know, you have to be very skeptical about what he says. But as all the prosecutors say, have been saying on TV, guys like, you know, former Justice Department officials and whatever, they go, hey, you know, when you're making a case, you often have to, you know, use testimony from criminals because they're the ones who know what the other criminals are doing. Right. So, you know, this, this is just the way that that works. The way you do it, though, is you corroborate what they're saying. And in Parnas's case, he's got a lot of receipts. I mean, you know, you look at these text messages and you look at the, at the documents that he's provided, all the pictures, everything like that. It, it, you know, Trump says he's never met him or, you know, he's only taken pictures with him, doesn't know the guy. It's obvious to any sentient person that he did know the guy and that there was, you know, I mean, there's videotape of him. There's all this other stuff. And, you know, that alone is new information that's vitally important to this impeachment case. Well, we don't even need to like it doesn't even matter if they knew each other. We we know that Donald Trump signed off on his defense yeah. attorney getting into a joint defense agreement with him. And it's like, you don't do that for random people, right? Like, it's not like John Dowd is coming to Donald Trump and saying, hey, there's a guy, he got busted for a low-level drug offense in, uh, you know, in Iowa. Uh, my grandmother and his grandmother, they were good friends at a pinochle, uh, you know, they used to get together for pinochle. Would you mind getting into a joint defense agreement with this guy? Oh, yeah. Well, as long as, you know, your grandma says it's OK. Like that doesn't happen. Right. Like you, you don't you don't get into a joint defense agreement with someone you don't know. Um, I mean, it's just absurd. And 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 people have to remember he's been in custody. Or at least all these documents that he has have been in custody for right. three months now. You know, he got picked up in in October. Well, it was definitely before Halloween because I went as Parnas as ha on Halloween. So uh, it, it must have been, you know, <laughs> mid to late October. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's not like he's sort of like reverse engineering the story now uh, since he, he got out of that defense agreement with Dowd. I mean, th this is it's hard for me to imagine a scenario and I, I you know, I undoubtedly this guy's not telling the whole truth to, to, you know, to Rachel uh, Maddow. Why, why would he? He's under no obligation to tell her anything that's truthful. Um, but if he's lying, he's certainly not doing it at the behest of, you know, Trump and other people, <laughs> right? Cause this doesn't help Trump at all. And it's not like it's a, <clears throat> I, I don't know how, you know, and, and my, my first thinking is something like this is some type of rat F, right? Like the, the, the story that Karl Rove supposedly planted, the story of George Bush's um, uh, going AWOL and, and doing it to hide the fact that he had actually gone AWOL um, by putting it with a bad messenger. Like maybe there's some of that going on here, but this is not there. There's it just doesn't make any sense. 
I don't think that is happening. And, and you know, we've got the phone call, you know, the perfect phone call. I mean, it's pretty clear right. that Trump was, uh, you know, was – we know that much. If nothing else, we know that he – personally extorted the Ukrainian president, uh, you know, and, and what, what we now know, uh, aside from that phone call, is all the machinations that were going on behind the scenes in this plot. And it went on for much longer than we realized. It included a lot more people than we realized. I mean, bringing in this stuff with, with um, Victoria Tenzing and Joe DeGeneva, I mean, we knew they were involved somehow. And this is where Parnas is valuable. It's not so much that, you know, I think he's, you know, a great guy and he just wants to, you know, save the republic or anything. But he has provided certain details about all these stories that we've seen swirling around about this Russian-Ukrainian uh, oligarch Dmitry Firtash and the quid pro quo with the prosecutor Lutsenko. Uh, I want to walk, I, I, I things- walk through these because this is important stuff that yeah, I think yeah, people okay. have ignored. The Firtash. Furtash is a is a Ukrainian oligarch that people think is mobbed up. He has been it's there's been, to the there, there is an attempt to um, to extradite him. He's in what Vienna now or something, and yeah. and there's been a long standing attempt to extradite him. The U.S. government has been trying to get this guy back into the United States. I can't remember exactly for what uh, charge. Racketeering for racketeering. And apparently, Furtash had the ability to get investigations of Burisma and Biden or to, to, to lean on the Ukrainian government or whatnot. He was going to deliver something for, to Parnas if Parnas, through Bill Barr, could get them to drop the extradi- extradition uh, efforts, right? Is that what the quid pro quo was in that instance? This is a separate quid yeah, pro quo. Yeah, only it was, it was Rudy that he was going to get okay, that Rudy, from. Okay, Rudy, okay. Right. V- Rudy, Victoria Tensing, and, and Joe DeGeneva, who had been involved in this plot from the very beginning, by the way. You know, they were involved back in, in the spring, with, working with John Solomon, that, that right-wing reporter that was, you know... At the Hill, the right. That every every yeah. story you hear quoted... Is it either a Jonathan Solomon story? Every every story, every time you hear something quoted by the Republicans, it's either a Jonathan uh, Solomon story, or one story that is been slightly warped by uh, Ken Vogel in Politico. T- put up a picture right. of T- of Tinsing and Joe Jeed and uh, th- these these folks up until you know now. Uh, have been more or less sort of like f- like freaks that you would see on Fox News or you know the um, or even like you know like World Net Daily types uh, that and and I want people to just put this up on the screen so that people remember what this these guys look like because they've seen them right and you're just you, these are guys that you look on television and you're like this is a lunatic. But these were full on operatives in this like they are full on players in this stuff. It's it's well, it's they, crazy. It, they, yeah, they've been right wing operatives for a long time. I wrote a big story about them for Salon that, that you know going back into they made their bones during the Clinton impeachment. So it all kind of come full circle here, um, and they became big DC celebrities. This co- you know legal eagle couple and all that stuff. And but you know they're definitely they're they're just right wing operatives. Basically, they do this kind of dirty work all the time. And you'll recall that both Tenzing and DeGeneva were interviewed by the president. Uh, to be his personal lawyer um, when Dowd and Downing dropped out. And they ended up, and we all thought it was going to happen. And then in a couple of days, it, they dropped out. And the word was that he didn't like the way they looked, which may be true. Um, <laughs> I mean, he does but, that. Um, but to uh, be fair, they, they, the reality is. They they dress like uh like he, like he's modeling his entire look after like um you know a heart to heart episode or like a Robert Conrad. <laughs> I'm dating myself so, here, but they're so they're perfect. they're of that age. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's exactly what he does. The turtlenecks, the whole thing. You yep. know, he's definitely yeah. He thinks he's Mr. Smooth, and he and Victoria are both known for being cigar smokers together. So you know, you get the picture. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Trump didn't like that. Um, but it's also obvious now, looking in retrospect, that they decided that everyone decided, including Rudy, who is friends with DeGeneva and and Tenzing, obviously, they're part of the same cabal, um, that they would be more useful doing this dirty back 
you know, backdoor kind of stuff that they're that they were doing in Ukraine. Uh, so they decided, you know, he would they would be more helpful on the outside. That's even what they said at the time. So clearly they were they were um, uh, recruited in this in this plot. And of course, Furtash is very very wealthy. And according to Parnas, he was paying Tenzing and Dijonova a million dollars plus a hundred thousand dollars a month. Um, and expenses. Nice work if you can get it, huh? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and where the money's coming for all this work that they're doing, that's a big question. We still wonder who, who's financing all this stuff. And it appears that Furtash was financing at least some of it because Parnas got $200,000 a month from this guy. So that's another part of this that's yet to unravel is the money that's financing all of Trump's um, legal uh, expenses and his, you know, this, these dirty um, operations that he's doing elsewhere. And, you know, I have no reason to believe that Ukraine's the only one, right? I mean, who knows what else he's really doing? Well, that's the thing is um, that, like, I, this is a lot of work for this one operation. Like, the idea that, like, this is all they did. This, I mean, yeah, okay. They uh, they did this whole thing for, but, but they don't do anything, you know, like, that's, I find that hard to believe. Yeah, I do too. I mean, and and for for Joe Biden, I mean, you know, what what is this? What you know, what is? I mean, I, I honestly think a lot of this really was Trump trying. He as much as he wanted to get Joe Biden, the other half of this story was just as important to him, which was trying to show that the Russians and he were framed in the 2016 election, and it was really Ukraine that was interfering in the election. You know, he's obsessive, and you know, he's been you know upset about the idea that he didn't legitimately win the election and who knows what other motivations he might have uh in all that but you know he did seem obsessed about that and has from the very beginning so um you know all of that seems to he has focused on it but you know these people you know this kind of thing you put together an operation like this you know it just seems so you know what? But on the other hand, I don't know, I was talking to somebody the other day, he said, well, you know, Trump isn't a real president. He doesn't do real presidential stuff. So, right. yeah, he's got time on his hands. This is what he what he spends his time doing is trying to look out for his own political, you know, well-being. And he spends all his time doing this sort of thing. You know, Nixon did a lot of that, too. But he also was, you know, actually, actually the president at the same time. Um, in any case, this whole thing, you know, that Furtash quid pro quo What's interesting about it is the fact that Parnas says, and, you know, he didn't offer any evidence of this, but it does track with certain other pieces of evidence that we've seen, that Bill Barr was, as he put it, on the team. And, you know, he, when you think about it, this right-wing legal cabal, which we're very familiar with, we, you know, we know who these people are, this, you know, Pat Cipollone, Bill Barr, um, you know, George Terwilliger, I mean, all these names, you know, you know, um, and the Federalist Society and, you know, operatives like, like DeGeneva and um, Tensing. This little right-wing group of lawyers in D.C., they all know each other. There, Rudy Giuliani, I'm sure he's part of that, too, even though he wasn't really a D.C. player, although I guess in recent years he's become a super, you know, lobbyist for foreign, you know, tyrants. Um, but, you know, Parnas suggests that, you know, Barr was in on this. And right. when you think about it, he'd almost have to be if they were going to deliver to Furtash what he wanted, which is right. lifting of the extradition order. I mean, who who else could could manage that? Um, you know, other than the president who, you know, could, you know, try to get Barr to do it and Barr himself. So, you know, you're you're looking at a situation where, you know, it, you, you go back and look at what Trump said in that uh, in the perfect phone call. You know, he said you can talk to Giuliani or, you know, Attorney General Barr. And that starts to look a little different under these circumstances, right? I right. mean, it starts to look like that, that's part. That's another of the quid pro quos that was having to be delivered. So that one is very, very interesting, and it sort of it, it dovetails with what Parnas was saying about his own fear of the U.S. Justice Department in this whole thing, and that at the that the you know Trump has consolidated power in the Republican Party and in the government, largely because of his uh, his naming of Bill Barr 
as attorney general, that that's where the muscle is coming from. And when you think about it, that's true, right? I mean, that's this Bill Barr has, has is now his his Roy Cohn protecting yep. him. He was looking and for does, one and he found it. Yeah, and he found it. All right. So, so you know, that's quid pro quo one, <laughs> and then there's another one too. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much here, and we're, we we will tease that out over the the, uh, the 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 coming days. I mean, here there's two quite well. There's two things I want to just touch on before before we we wrap this up. One is, what do you think is going to happen with all this information in terms of whether it's going to actually make it? Is it just going to run? Are we just going to hear this story parallel to the impeachment? A and B. I want to talk about. I, I think what is a huge failure. By, you know, you mentioned giving credit to Chuck Schumer. I have no idea how much Chuck Schumer was even read into any of what uh, Nancy Pelosi was doing. (laughs) I think he was just like, look, as long as I don't have to uh, come out and I'm going to vote against the um, the the new NAFTA uh, because that might um, maybe put, um, you know, Elizabeth Warren in a uh, tough jam or something like that. I mean, who knows why he did that? (laughs) Uh, Maybe he's just afraid of getting challenged in the primary. But um. Uh, but Chuck Schumer, if I was Chuck Schumer right now, what I would do is take five minutes from the uh, statements and the, uh, the 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 press statements I'm putting out about, you know, what I've done for, you know, consumer advocacy on, you know, now you can have a different type of rolling suitcase on your air flights or whatever it is that he's working on this week. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 use some of that camera time that I'm I, I'm I'm constantly seeking, and talk about how Mitch McConnell is trying to hide this process from the 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 U.S. public. They're they're allowing like one camera in there. They're allowing they they aren't allowing reporters to come out and file during the hearings. I mean, this is. This is, you know, talk about low, low hanging fruit. The, you, you know, Chuck Schumer's getting all clever with all these different procedural votes. Why not do the biggest procedural one of all, which is, hey, this has got to be transparent. You know, like we, we the American public deserves to see this. And not only is there value in that politically, it seems to me, there's also if you there's a material benefit at the end of that, which is you want all of these things that are going on to resonate for months and months. And if people don't see it, there's no way for the news to cover it. That's absolutely true. And the last part is really what's important. I mean, the news cannot cover this if they're not there and they're not able to, to sort of, you know, give feedback to, to the, to the country. I mean, look, it's going to be dull on a certain level. I mean, uh, you know, when you're in a, on, on a jury, for instance, I mean, I've done it a few times, you know, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're, there's nothing else going on, right? You're just sitting there, you're looking at the evidence, you're very highly focused on it. And even then it's kind of hard to, <laughs> to keep your concentration. If it's, you know, if this is just one single static camera and a bunch of people droning on, and maybe, you know, you don't even hear most of it, this is, it's a, it's a real missed opportunity because I remember in the Clinton trial, and that one went on, by the way, for like something like six or seven weeks. Um, I was riveted to it, but I'm not sure how many people actually watched the whole thing. But it was, um, you know, for the most part, I think, you know, people had sort of knew already because of the Star report what the actual case was. Right. I don't think that's true this time. Yep. I think I think this time it, it's really important how they present this case and you know it's briefly getting back to Parnas, one of the things that these uh, that the house managers and their lawyers I'm sure are pulling all nighters is trying to put together a timeline where they can fold in this evidence that Parnas has given in the in the documents if not his testimony. And I don't know if they're going to interview him or not, but if they they have all these documents and if they put those in there with what they know from the FOIA request and from their own evidence and testimony during the hearings, um, you know, they got to work pretty hard to get all that stuff together. But that that kind of a timeline laying out a case the way that you would in an opening argument in a in a in a, you know, trial in a normal trial, that's exceedingly important. And they have to find a way to to engage the public on that as much as because that's what this is really about right we know that republicans they're all you know they're whores they're they're not gonna i mean i there's no way that they're gonna get 13 
Republicans to to cross, maybe right. a few to cross to get witnesses or to vote, you know, vote against him or something. But you know, this is not the outcome is 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 already determined. Um, so th- this is all about you know trying to present this you know to the public. And I agree with you. I do not I do not know. Um, exactly how all this is going to come out. The one thing that I do think is it probably important to to remember is that some of the House, we thought that some of the people who might be House managers, people like Jamie Raskin, who's very good at sort of, you know, sorting out and who know the case backwards and forwards, they're not on the team. So they will be working with the media, I assume, to explain and try and, you know, they'll have these panels with Claire McCaskill and God knows who else, right. you know. But hopefully they will have some of these people sitting there who know the case and who can, you know, it, help explain it to the public because they're not going to be involved in the trial itself. So, you know, that's that's my one, you know, I'm kind of clinging to that, <laughs> hoping that, that there will be at least some but, but why, ability but, of... But why do... Why... Do I barely know this? Why did what I just say come as a surprise to 90 percent of the people who heard my voice? <laughs> why do we not have the Democrats, every Democrat? Why, is, right. why are they not saying what is Mitch McConnell doing? The point is to have this in the Senate, not in the cloakroom. Like, you know, the, the, like this is right. <laughs> cover up, cover up, cover up. Uh, yes, exactly. Mantra, right. Exactly. It's annoying. I mean, it's it's not it's worse than annoying. It's it's more political malpractice. Like, you know, it's yeah. just like, I, I'm sorry. Like, you know, the, the whole point of this uh, exercise is it, there's there's two aspects of this. There's the you hold him to account because you want to at least pay some homage uh, to the idea of accountability. And they <laughs> failed on that accord, as far as I'm concerned, by not including a whole host of other articles of impeachment yep. in this. Like, even if it was like, well, it would be too hard to explain these other things. You know what? Put them in there just so, so that so that history knows that you've done that. Right. I mean, you don't want to defend those. Fine. Just put them in there. And so that history knows that that, that we have created some accountability. You you you, you kidnap children. You, um, you you try and ban Muslims. I mean, a, a whole array of different things. Emoluments. Corruption. You're, you're putting corruption. money in your own pocket. Your kids are crooks. I but mean, it's all there. Then the other half of it is completely political. And, you know, some of those uh, benefits are are, are, are are very distinct and tangible. We want to um, have a Democratic Senate. We're going to make them take hard votes. But some of it is also stuff like, you know, you're building a narrative and you don't know yeah. when that's going to pay off. But part of it is Mitch McConnell is is running this like it's a secret uh, Death Star, you know, star chamber and, instead <laughs> of actually, you know, the, the, the chamber of the Senate. And there's one person situation who can make this case more than anything else and he doesn't doesn't i don't know what the political cost is to him and that's chuck schumer and he should be out there right now talking about why is mitch mcconnell um keeping the american public out of this are they afraid You're right. there, I mean, there it's, is, it's just... the, the, and the narrative is clear what are they hiding why are they covering <laughs> up why can't we have witnesses where's mulvaney where's pompeo i mean this is the easiest thing in the world and in fact you know in a lot of ways i, I think pelosi did set schumer up for this with you know all these you, you know shoes dropping over the course of of the last few weeks as to say look at all this information they won't let us right. you know they won't ha- give it to us what are they hiding and that's the narrative and they could take that all the way into november this was a massive massive cover up by the republicans yeah in the meantime that- uh, chuck schumer's probably got to work on some bike lanes uh, out in uh, long island or something <laughs> The leader of exactly. the Senate, you know, uh, he's Democrats. He's got important things to do. You know, kitchen table issues. Exactly. The Baileys told me not to say anything. They they were really upset about these uh, bike lanes. <laughs> um, uh, Digby, thanks so much for your time today. As always, uh, a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Sam. Bye-bye. All right, folks. We're going to take a quick break. God. This just like, this is this is incompetence. Be the leader of the Democrats in the Senate or let somebody else do it. And this is just taking this is just like have a press conference, which, you know, Chuck Schumer, it's like. 
you 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 could remove 90 percent of his brain mass and he the one thing he would know how to do is to walk up in front of a microphone based upon his entire career all right we're gonna take a break and when we come back judy gold is gonna get more angry than i am that's why we have her be right back So, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned earlier uh, when we had Digby on that it, uh, it is my hope to um, that uh, that that uh, based upon Digby's theme song, I'm going to insist that my son have a uh, uh, a band at his uh, bar mitzvah and they play that Digby theme song. Um, and also, uh, the second song that I'm going to follow that uh, at his bar mitzvah is, of course, this one. Level-headed. Fuck you! Calm, cool, and collected. I have a bigger penis than him. Judy Gold is on the line to keep us all connected. <laughs> what the fuck is the matter with him? A steady hand to guide us. She'll keep us calm and carry on. No fucking way! <laughs> <laughs> Too bad Jimmy Reefer Cuck didn't find a worthy of a song. Well, Judy go. And he's a, he's such a fucking penis head liar. I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's our, the president of the United States. That's the president. What the fuck? Like this guy. He's, okay. I, <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Judy. Wait, is that before or after the hot Torah that you're going to play? No, of course song? at the reception. I'm not going to, uh, although, uh, although. Oh, yeah, you don't want to, yeah. I'll, I can sit, well, you should do it in Hebrew. We should do, we should do a Yiddish version of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, Judy, yeah. uh, I have to say that it sounds like you are in, in some type of internment uh, facility. Where are you calling from? I uh, I am. Is it bad reception? No, it's the reception's good. It's just there's a there's a oh. timber there's a timber to your voice or a lack of timber. Oh yes, yes. But well, don't worry, that's going away right now. But uh, we're in Florida. Oh. Um, because we're visiting. Uh, we're at Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> and I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, no, we're in Florida. I have two gigs. I have a gig tonight in Aventura, and I have a gig uh, two. Two shows tomorrow night in Boca, in Boca Raton, um, and they all fucking love that piece of shit here. What the fuck is going on, Judy? I, okay, I 
I just had this vision of you like camped out in front of Mar-a-Lago, uh, like doing like a protest on the on the side of Route Let's One or it. whatever it is with a, with a sign yelling at, uh, at at the cars that come by. Is that what uh, would it take? I, what kind of GoFundMe do we need to get going to have that happen? How many how many calories on my Fitbit do you think um, I'll have if I do that? If I do a protest in front of. I think we. I think you go on. You go on a hunger strike in front of uh, Mar-a-Lago. Right. I'm not fucking going on a hunger strike for that fat piece of shit. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Fuck him. Uh, I. I just. Can I just say something? Of course. Before we begin. Yeah. I feel like we like, have. How much more? How fucking much? Ken Star? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Are you seriously? Do you want to hear something really, really disturbing? I, I, you don't have too much time. I know this. How long is this? Right. This is two minutes long. All right. So Ken Starr is uh, going to be joining the defense team with Alan Dershowitz. The last time these two mm-hmm. crazy guys teamed up, it was it was or in Jeffrey Florida. Epstein. It was in Florida to defend Jeffrey Epstein, the yes, yes. M- mass uh, serial sex trafficker. And um, right. and then but before in the interim between uh, he was um, he was uh, Ken Starr was a uh, president at Baylor University. Uh, right. This is back in uh, in in the the like 2015 or so. And right. um, he's a, a, a woman who was raped at Baylor. Emailed Ken Starr. With the subject line, I was raped at Baylor, sent it to his direct email. Uh, she uh, emailed right. a bunch of other people. And so Ken Starr was asked about it on Channel 10 News. Uh, I don't know where this is, where, where the news is. But here, we've played this clip in the past, but you got to listen to this. It's insane. It's this email sent from a rape victim to a number of people with the subject line, I was raped at Baylor, that's been part of the debate during the sexual assault investigation. The victim, whose identity was concealed, appeared on ESPN's Outside the Lines on Wednesday. She sent the email in the fall of 2015 about a rape that happened in 2009. A few hours after that interview aired, we met with Starr at the president's home on the Baylor campus. One of our questions was about that email. What about um, the victim that came forward saying that she had personally sent you an email and Art Riles an email? saying in the subject line that she was raped at Baylor. Did you ever see that email? I honestly may have. I'm not denying that I saw it. But it's what happens moments later that brings the interview to a halt. What you can't see during this interview is my news director behind me. You also can't see a woman named Mary Spate, who asked my boss to promise not to use that portion of the interview. When he says no, she interrupts our interview. Well, I want to point out, I, I need to talk to Jen Starr. Jen, Jen Starr. Okay. Okay. I need to talk to you, sir. Okay. Do you ask great questions? Okay, great. Can I ask him one more question? I have I got to talk to you. Okay. Okay. Spate was introduced to our crew as a longtime family friend. What we've since learned is she has a long resume in crisis management. She's a communications specialist, owns her own firm, and was once a director of media relations at the White House for President Reagan. She also coached Starr while he gave testimony to impeach Bill Clinton. After a few minutes away, the two returned. She needs to ask you that question again. Whether you do it on camera or not, it's up to you. I just want to make sure it doesn't end up misedited. Okay. We ask Starr again, and he answers, but turns to Spate, apparently for coaching. All I'm going to say is I honestly have no recollection of that. Of seeing any email? Is that okay? Don't look at me. Look at her. Then Star answers again. I honestly have no recollection of seeing such an email, and I believe that I would remember seeing such an email. The President University gets lots of emails. I don't even see oh a lot God. of the emails that come into the office of the President. I have no recollection of it. None. While Star calls for transparency and openness, it appears his message is still being tightly controlled. I, can you believe this? I can't. Fuck him. <laughs> First of all, I don't know Lev Parnas. I don't even know who he is. I have no idea. I've never met him. I've maybe, I take pictures with a lot of people. 
I take a lot of photos. You know, I'm president. You know, I meet people. I take photos with them. I fucking sexually assault them. You know, I don't remember. You know, that's also exactly what Devin Nunes says about Parnas. It's almost Uh, identical, these things. They're just, I mean, but here's the thing. You can't, I, they're fucking, how can you fucking defend these motherfucking lying pieces of shit? How can you defend them? How can these Republicans stand there when they know? Come on. All right. Lem Parnas might be a fucking scumbag, but Trump is a bigger scumbag. You know, it's like, and everyone in this fucking cabinet is in the fucking, well, not in his cabinet, but you know, all these people that were part of well, his campaign his cabinet. are in the fucking <laughs> jail. <laughs> It's, um, he doesn't have a cabinet. It really is like, um, you know, I mean, uh, if Parnas is telling the truth of some of what he's saying, I mean, it, 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 and, and, and I think it's, you know, the, the tr- you know, Trump gets them all involved. Nobody's going to be here right. unless and you're part of uh, the, the, the team. Uh, you know, it's just like it's, it's all just Serpico. It's just like, you know, it's that okay. crude. It's Here's like, the thing. Here's the thing: the fact that 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 person coaching Ken Cunt Star is a woman is even fucking worse. You know, what what, what do these women hate themselves? Fuck. And Susan Collins, let me tell you something: she better fucking do the right thing. What? No, she's not. Come on, come on, Judy. I know she will. Seriously. She won't. I love. I love Sarah Gideon. She's running against her. Go donate five dollars to Sarah Gideon. Anything. She's fucking great. And she's my neighbor's cousin, but she's really great. The the uh, the the Collins. All, all these Republicans now. I mean, it, it, they they have been on this ship for too long. There's no turning back. Right. There's no. They need to right. be. They need to be uh, thrown overboard. All of these people who are around him. I mean, this. They got this book that's come out now where you know Trump is like apparently like yelling at the generals. You're all dopes and babies and whatnot, and everybody just stood around watching him do this. Like I, you know, they probably are, but uh, the 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 bottom line is like there is no. They're all implicated, the, and and the worst thing I think we can do at this point is to sort of say like. Well, we're going to allow some of the good ones to, you know, to they're not doing it. It's not happening. There no there's no value right. to these people. Um there there's certainly nobody's going to be this cowardly and then step out of the line and become some type of leader of of the country. You know what I mean? Like it, it's Well, and plus it's also like look. That orange fucking piece of shit sits there with the same fucking talking point. It's a hoax. Everyone knows it's a hoax. It, it's, it's just like, like, come on, get some new material. You need some new writers. It's all fun. And you think, come on, Les Parnas is, all right, he's a scumbag, but he's not law. I mean, why wouldn't I, you know who I think they should get for Trump's team? Who? I think he's doing a fantastic job. Lev Parnas is lawyer. He's very well-spoken. <laughs> he didn't say a word. That guy, or that guy Bondi? Not a fucking thing. Not a fucking thing. <laughs> well, what the Rachel, that he's, you know, just nothing. I mean, better that he's not saying anything. Let Lev Parnas speak. Um, (laughs) I really don't know how much more I can take of this. And if he get, is he going to get four more years? Is he going to get four more years? Is he? He might. No, he's not. He's not. I can't fucking deal with it. What's my heart rate? I got a new Fitbit. Okay, so. <laughs> You've got to get that online. You've got to put that, like, somehow, like, embed that in your Twitter uh, your Twitter feed or your Twitter bio, whatever your uh, heart rate heart is. Rate? I feel like that could, that, that's, did, it's like one of those webcams on, like, an eagle's yeah. nest or something that people could spend hours just watching. I'm going to do a little heart with the rate on it. Um. Listen, did you watch the signing of the articles of impeachment? The signing of signing in of everyone? I saw a clip of it where Pelosi, uh, where everybody came in there and they all got the pens. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, not that one. The one where they, the one where they, the senator signed the. Um, I didn't see that. Oath. No. Oh, you didn't see the senator signing the oath. Okay. It was like a fucking hair club for men commercial. <laughs> it was so bad. It's like it was the the camera was on top. They none of them have fucking hair. None of them, and they're all white. And too bad they didn't have fucking cameras in the their penises so they can see how fucking small they are. <laughs> I feel like you're uh, you're not happy with what's going on in the Senate. I just I, look. How much more? How much more evidence? Everyone he he is in contact with or works with is in jail. They're all fucking liars. He just sits and lies. He stands there and lies. Like that fucking speech where he's walking out, you know, with the fucking light behind him like he's Jesus Christ. Well, as long as I'm president, Iran will not have a nuclear weapon. Good afternoon. He's such a fucking... And they all stand behind him. Like, but it's... What the fuck? And then he lies about it, blaming Obama. He's such a fucking idiot. He's stupid. The fucking president should be smarter than the fucking doorman in my building. I don't even have a doorman, but the security guard guy. Well, that dude. Well, he's pretty smart, that guy. Yeah. The security guard guy, guy he's fucking sleeps the whole time. Listen, <laughs> I, I don't know what the fuck is going on. I can't take much more. Don't you think Lev Parnas is telling the truth? I think Lev Parnas is telling the truth about some of it anyways. Um, I think he's probably still, you know, Lev Parnas is trying to save his skin. So, right. Uh, I think he's trying. Wait, can we just say one thing yeah. about Lev Parnas? Okay. He's 10 years younger than me. What? Yeah. He's in his 40s. He is? If you look like that in your 40s, would you not kill yourself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. He's younger than me. Yeah. I know. He's young. He has five kids. He's oh, I want them to I want them to um interview Igor and they can have two cameras, one for each eye. Wow. How old Wow, Lev Parnas is uh 6 years younger than me. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. 46. Yeah. Wow. And Igor has one eye on the right and one eye going the other. Yeah, they're just <laughs> fucking disgusting. And how about how Giuliani is not on the um, the lawyer list? Oh, you mean in the, of, you in, know, for, in the in the impeachment? Yeah. yeah. Would you put him on there? I wouldn't. No. No. I, I but Sam. Yeah. How is this happening? How is this happening? And then the Democrats are having stupid fucking fights. Like, it's ridiculous. Well, they didn't shake hands, though. That's pretty big. Who? I'm, I'm joking. Oh, Sanders wait. What, the funniest part was when Tom Sire goes over and goes, <laughs> hey, hey, I just wanted to say hi. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> hi, uh, hi, hi, Bernie. Yeah, good. I'm yeah, 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 right now. Exactly. Okay, good. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. That's uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm on the same with you. How many okay. times do you think uh, Tom Steyer? Okay. How many times do you think Tom Steyer has had anybody react to him that way? The billionaire comes up to you. He wants to. I just want I to know. say. I just want to say hi and shake your hand. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Yeah, 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 Tom. I, listen, I don't have time for this shit. Right, you know, Bernie Sanders. It was like, so I, funny. Bernie Sanders is probably like the yeah. only person that Tom Steyer has come in contact with in uh, a decade that isn't excited at the prospect that maybe uh, he'll oh, give him some money. Right, I know it was so. It was so like miserable Jewish. Like I, I can't right now with your bullshit. <laughs> you know, this is why Jews have a hard time keeping home healthy. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Tom Steyer is going to sign the, up as a... Hi, can I get you? Can I get you? Get away from me. <laughs> can I wipe your ass? I, I, I can't right now. All right. We got... Listen, I know you got to take a phone call at one thirty. Um, just quickly, though, tell me about who you're doing shows for in Boca and in uh, down in Florida. Okay. Well, I hope I'm not doing shows for people who love you-know-who. Right. But I tonight I'm in Aventura at the Aventura 
cultural arts whatever center. Is that a, then, is that a town, I, Aventura? What is that a place? I don't know what that is, Aventura. Is that a city? Aventura. In... It's in Florida. It's like North Miami. Okay. All right. Of course. Yeah. It's in North Miami. It's called Aventura. Right. Okay. Then I'm in Boca. Right, Boca. I can't right now. Um, and I have at the Boca Black Box Saturday. I have two shows. My album dropped today. It's called Conduct Unbecoming. Oh, I wish my soundboard worked. It doesn't work right now. Oh, wait. There you go. I got 3% on it now. Um, that's great. Wow. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm overweight, but I'm going to lose a little weight. And uh, <laughs> I just, I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't. Look, fucking Lindsay fucking Grant. I can't. I just, like, they're just fucking assholes. Like, I just want to go up to these people and say, what is what you get? look at these fucking scum? He doesn't even know what Pearl Harbor is, you fucking idiot. Well, if you do that, certainly videotape it. Oh, I will. I will. Judy, uh, have you know, yeah, yeah. Well, do you have to go? Yeah, or you don't have to go. It's, it's one twenty-seven. I'm like, yeah, that good, good, good. <laughs> what? Well, I just I want to make sure. Do you, I know you got. You told me you had one thirty. You need to make phone call. It's one twenty-seven. Call me at one thirty. Okay. Mean, okay. Look. All right. Good. What do you want from me? Good. Good. All right. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, I mean, I'm just I'm, I'm just saying I'm, that to everything now. Just Boca is like there's going to be a lot of like do you, like I'm curious as to the audience you get in Boca. Is it because I associate Boca Raton well, get, with like grandmas and right. like you know I, I I had driven down there from Connecticut. Uh, down to Boca Raton when I was in college because I wanted to not pay for any place. Stayed with my right. buddy's grandma in some gated, yeah. you know, like retirement community type of thing. And we went out to Tequila Willie's there. Is Tequila Willie still in that, that parking lot or wherever it was? Okay. You know, Sam, I'm 57 years old. I don't fucking care about Tequila Willie's, okay? Well, but they have shooters. They have, uh, they have... They have uh, waitresses coming by with like, with 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 holsters and and shooters, and they take it out and they just pour you a little tequila willy. Oh yeah, good, yeah, good, 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 yeah. Listen, but who comes to the shows? Like, a, a lot, are there young people there? I'm I don't telling know. you right now, yes. Oh, okay. I'm telling you, a lot of gays have moved down here. Um, there's a big, huge gay population. You know, you know, you think we're young now, Sam. You're like, oh, it's it's the, we're at the age, and the snowbirds they're coming down. And Sam, I don't know if you realize you're fucking old. You're not like I to go in a tequila willies anymore. No, I'm, that's all I'm thinking about. I hear Boca, right, and I'm like, like tequila willies. Here's the thing: they're still around. You know how like you know how when we were younger, and you were like you'd meet someone's grandparents, and you'd be like, oh my god, they're so cool and hip, and blah blah blah, and, and um. Oh, and then you'd meet other people's grandparents, and they lived in Florida, and they went to dinner at five, you know. Right. Our generation is now splitting in two. Like, we're at the age where we're it's 55 and older, Sam. 55 and older. I'm not there yet. The retirement. Close. You're very close. I know. So I have a six-year-old child, for God's sakes. When's the bar mitzvah? Not for seven years. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I'm screwed. I was like, boy, that went fast. Mm, not quite. All right. What about a bat mitzvah? That's, that already happened. Mila had her bat mitzvah. And how was it? It was good. It was good. We didn't think to uh, play uh, your theme song there. Um. Well, how many people were there? wasn't huge. <laughs> I had Arrow right. Smith play. Did she, and so we uh, cut back did on Did she read dinners. out of the Torah? Did she? Oh yeah, of course. Were you proud? Yeah, moderately. What? Did you cry? <laughs> yeah, of course I did. You know I did. All right. I know it's so like you can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's been two times where I've 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 basically been brought to tears. One was her bat mitzvah, and one time when I was on top of a when I was on a mountain, we were snowboarding together, and I was waiting for her to come down. I was just about to go down like one of those really steep. Um, Sort of like um, double blue diamond trails or whatever it is, 
Yeah. And uh, I was waiting for her and I was like, going to tell her, okay, now look down the hill and, you you know, get a notion of how you're going to go down. And she just went right right by me. And I realized like, oh, my God, she's better at this than me. And she doesn't need you. She, oh, no. I mean, by far didn't need me, but was better at something that I taught her to do. And that oh, I found. So it was a competitive thing. You no, know, it wasn't competitive. I was, a... I was proud. I was proud. I was proud. I was proud. Like she's she's surpassed me. You you just said she was better than me. So I was crying. OK, <laughs> you didn't say I was proud. You said, OK, Elisa, no. Elisa's getting in on this. She, he's crying tears of joy because, you know, she's a therapist. Don't yes, be in I a was. relationship with a therapist. I can't. <laughs> oh, well, We've been listening to your show and watching your show on the phone. Well, uh, good. Well, she's right. I was I was proud. I, Shut like, up. It was the one moment where I was like, oh, my also, God, like that's why you have children. Right. So that they're so that you're you're they surpass you and go further than you. Right. That's like why you that that's yeah, how you feed exactly. your 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 sense now, of immortality. You have children. So that they can take care of you and wipe your the shit out of your ass and pluck your chin hairs. And, you know, that's why you have children. That's yeah. the only reason. I wouldn't tell your boys good, that. Good, good, yeah, good. Wipe my ass. <laughs> All right. All right, well, I'll let Mila know that. Uh, Judy Gold. <laughs> I love you. I love Please you do something. I can't take it anymore. I can't, honestly. We got to do, I know the march is on Sunday, but we got to do more. We got to be fucking out there protesting. I just, it's, it's ridiculous that he gets away with lying on national television, the fucking media. Like it's a lie. It's called a lie. It's not a, oh, he was incorrect. It's a fucking lie. And he's a fucking liar. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, hang in there, Judy. Um, uh, what's, what's, what we should maybe double check that Fitbit. Appreciate it. Okay, Sam, uh, it's now, at, oh no, it didn't go up that much. Listen, I get, I just want you to know, and everyone over at Majority Report, that yeah. I have so many people. I had a guy at my show the other night that was in New York from out of town, and he was from Georgia, and he came to my show because of Majority Report. So I wow. want you to know, you have very, I love your listeners, and I love your show, and you guys rock. Well, they love and you I too. <laughs> Piece of shit. Hang in there, Judy. Hang in there. Thank right, you so yeah, much. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Judy Gold, ladies and gentlemen. Check out her new album. I didn't realize she had a new album. We'll put a link to that on uh, uh, our uh, homepage. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break and head into the fun half of the program. Just a reminder, you can support this show by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you get the Free show, free of commercials. And then you get the fun half. And this week, you know, every quarter or so, we have a bonus that we put up. And um, if you're a member, you get the uh, the vid- access to the video. We'll, we'll, put it, we'll put the link in it one more time today, uh, Brendan. Okay? In the uh, Friday members post. The video of our coverage of the debate and about halfway, three quarters of the way through uh, Virgil, Texas of Chapo Trap House came in. And um, and I know we talked a little bit too much over the debate. We'll we'll, we'll correct that next time. Um, And then we're wrapping up and I'm literally just like two lines away from saying, all right, well, that's good. Thanks, everybody. And then there's a knock at the door and I thought we were going to get in trouble because of the nature of this building. There's some, you know, it's not just all businesses. It's a mixed use building. And, uh, the Chapo trap house crew like falls in almost, I would say. Right. I mean, I wouldn't say stumble. I would just like sort of felt like they just like, just like poured in. Yeah. It's like a cartoon when everyone moves through the door at once. Right. Kind of, and wafted in they yes and then uh and then they basically bum rushed the 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 set and i think it was i think it was that bottle of whiskey that perrine had anyways um that's available to you if you're a member of this program uh you can watch that in all its glory and of course you get the fun half and uh you support the program so join the majority report.com also am quickie 
If you have not subscribed for free to the AM Quickie, do so now at amquickie.com. So just take a minute, check it out. You, every morning starting um, at about 8 a.m., maybe a little bit earlier, but by sure by 8 a.m., you will get uh, five minutes of the day's headlines, give you a little sense of uh, what to expect on this day. Uh, some days you can't wa- listen to the majority report, catch up. This will give you an opportunity to give you a sense of what the headlines are that day. So check it out, amquickie.com. Also, as always, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY to get 10% off. Uh, there is a will be a TMBS on Saturday. Is that is he going to play the Lula thing? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we have a guest in studio. I'm not entirely sure who, but it's at 5.30 tomorrow okay. night. 5.30. Uh, check out Literary Hangover. Um, d- most recent episode is a poem called The Sotweed Factor by Ebenezer Cook, where we talk about the uh, 17th century Chesapeake area tobacco industry. Uh, and also, as always, uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. The Antifa. A- a- Antifada. Uh, here, uh, Jamie's podcast. All right. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? Well, who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back. I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks. Fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are black, 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 black Africans. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. black. And the Africans are black, 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 black. There doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists. Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Pussy, 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 pussy